evening to everyone. I hope that the Lord has blessed you throughout this week and that his hand has been upon your family. This evening, uh, our Friday evening services, I, I don't know how much longer that we're going to have to do this. We're going to do this until we're able to reopen church, have church open for uh, people to come in and pray on Wednesday evening, Friday evening, and Sunday morning. <clears throat> And of course, you can always call any of the members or uh, Brother Jeremy, our, our youth pastor, or myself, and we'll be glad to pray with you so that you come to know Christ as Savior, or if you have something that you'd just like for us to lift up to the Lord for you in prayer. I don't, it seems like it's been a lifetime since we've been able to gather together, and I know that we truly miss that. This Sunday morning, we're going to have Sister Carla, our, our church pianist, and uh, to Cheryl that are going to be singing this, uh, this Sunday morning. Then Sunday after that, Sister Brittany will be back here singing with us again. So it is nice to be able to at least have on Sunday mornings people come in and worshiping and singing, leading us into worship. I want to lead us in worship this evening by not singing, not singing, but reading a psalm to you, Psalm 67. God be merciful unto us and bless us. Cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. Selah is a musical term. It means to stop and think. Think about this. We need God's blessings upon us. We need his face to shine upon us. Verse 2. That thy way may be known upon the earth, and thy saving health. I love that. Saving health. Not only does Jesus save our souls from hell, but he also gives us health for our bodies, strength that we have among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Let, uh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy and govern the nations upon the earth. Selah. Again, think about this. Praise this. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. <laughs> God bless us. Hallelujah. God shall bless us Man, wow, that's good. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. God is good. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, then I'm going to turn the service over to our youth pastor, Pastor Jeremy. So let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you this evening. Look forward to being fed by your word from the Gospel of John. Father, I pray that you give an anointing to Brother Jeremy like he wants, and so much more, Lord God, that you'd fill him with your spirit. And uh, that, our, that our ears would be open to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us. That our hearts would be obedient. That, Lord God, that in these terrible, different times, difficult times for many families, Lord God, that you'd help us to be ever faithful to you. Bless all those, all those that are listening this evening, Lord God. Give them your anointing and uh, care for us. We don't ask this because we deserve it. We pray in the name of our precious Savior. Jesus Christ. Amen. This time we're going to turn the service over to our, our youth pastor, Pastor Jeremy Matton. Lord bless you, my brother. Praise the Lord for you. Praise the Lord for you. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, <clears throat> go ahead and open up to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And we're going to pick up where we left off, starting in verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31. And the title of this evening's message is a simple one. Divine Truth. Speaking of truth, you may have had someone ask you this, or maybe you thought about this yourself. What is truth? If you do a quick internet search to look up the definition, then you'll notice it is a word that is often used or included in its own definition. People try to define truth as truth. It's something that's true. Truth is fact. And the problem is that some people claim lies to be truth which makes us wonder, how do we know what real truth is? The answer is, we turn to God's Word. 
which is absolute divine truth. So as we go through this evening's passage, I would ask you, do you know what divine truth is? You see, divine truth will set you free. It will reveal who you serve, and it will refute what others try to portray as truth when in fact it's nothing but lies. And those are the three points we're going to look at as we go through this evening. So this evening again we're going to look at how Jesus explains divine truth to the crowd and the religious leaders. And at this time before we go on, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, I do thank you again for allowing me to be here on this Friday evening to just share your word with all those that are able to watch this, either live or later, or maybe they'll listen to it later, Lord. We just thank you for all that you do. I ask you, Lord God, to continue to guide and direct our leaders as they go through these times like they've never known. I pray that they seek you, Lord, for guidance and wisdom on how to proceed, on how to start to open up our state and our country back up to people being able to go out and do what we're so accustomed to doing. I do thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. I do ask you, Lord God, to be with us this evening. Let all the minds and all the hearts listening to your word, not my words, but your word, be opened up. I do love you and I thank you for all that you do, for all the blessings, Lord, that you have given me. So many that I don't even know where to begin, but I do thank you for all of those. And most of all, I thank you for what we're about to receive from your hand. And as always, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our first point of this evening's message is divine truth frees. And it covers verses 31 to 36. And when we get to verse 32, it's probably a verse many of you have heard before. You may even know it and have it memorized and have quoted it. So beginning in verse 31, the Apostle John is writing, he says, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Jesus is, of course, talking about the people in the crowd that's mentioned in verse 30, which says, As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. He's talking to those who have come to saving faith in Jesus. He's talking to them. And he tells them, If you continue in my word, You are truly disciples of mine. He's saying if you continue in his word, you continue to believe in him, trust him as Lord and Savior, follow his commandments, then they are true disciples of his. Anyone who is a true disciple of Jesus, this is exactly what we must do. Continue in his word, and we are proven to be disciples of His. This doesn't just apply to those here in the crowd. This applies to all Christians today. If we are to be disciples of Jesus, this is what we must do. The first step of discipleship is to be baptized. This is to identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and to make a public Confession of your faith. I know there's a lot of different teaching and doctrine on what baptism is and what it's not. But I just wanted to share this with you this evening. It is simply a profession, public profession or confession of your faith. It identifies with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And it is the first step of being a disciple. It's not how you get saved. It is the first act you do after being saved. To let people know that you are saved. And of course we know, because we have all of the Gospels, 
that in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, Jesus tells his apostles and his disciples to go forth and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus is teaching that baptism is important. It's something that as a disciple you need to do. It's the first step in continuing in His Word because He's saying to do this. Continuing to obey Scripture is the fruit or the evidence of genuine saving faith. And Jesus is teaching those who just got saved here in this crowd that disciples of His do not just get saved and do nothing. They continue to be sanctified or being made more like Him and less like themselves. You see, we do this by being baptized, by studying God's Word, hearing it taught and preached, by praying, and by fellowshipping with other believers. There's something to be said about fellowshipping together with other believers. And that may even seem more important to us today than it has maybe ever because it's been taken away from us for over a month now. But fellowshipping with other believers is very important. We can strengthen each other. We can encourage each other. We can lean on each other. And then, of course, real disciples are learners and followers. And what this means is simply, we must put into practice what we learn from God's Word. It's not enough just to read your Bible and study it, but you've got to live by it. We've got to live by it to be true disciples. When we do this, when we are true disciples of Jesus, we know truth. We know divine truth. And Jesus himself says, this truth sets us free. You see, this is the only way you can know true freedom. And maybe you're asking yourself this evening as you're listening, what exactly does it free us from? There are four things that it frees us from. The first is it frees us from the penalty of sin. When we trust Christ as Lord and Savior, it means we have accepted the free gift of salvation. We have accepted the fact that Jesus Christ died a substitutionary death on the cross at Calvary. He shed His blood to pay our sin debt in full. He paid the penalty of sin, so we are free from it. We no longer have to pay it. You see, we do not have to experience God's wrath because of sin when we are saved, because Jesus experienced it on our behalf. Second, it frees us from the power of sin. Sin has great power. When we trust Christ as Lord and Savior, we are born again or we are made new. We have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us, guiding us and empowering us to avoid temptation and sin and to overcome sin when we do slip up, when we do stumble and commit sin. Trusting Jesus as Lord and Savior means sin has lost its power over us because we are now tapped into God's power. Third, we are free from the purpose of sin. Meaning we are free from death. You see, Paul tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Sin leads to death. That's what Paul is saying. But when we trust Christ as Lord and Savior, we have eternal life, not death. 
Yes, these bodies may stop working, but that does not mean death. It simply means that when that happens, we will go to our eternal home and be with Jesus in heaven. When Jesus paid our sin debt in full on the cross, He defeated death for all of His disciples. Death has no power over Christians. We need to remember that. We need to keep that into the forefronts of our minds because especially in the recent days, death has been more in front of us it seems. You can't even turn the news on without hearing about death tolls going up because of this virus. But as Christians, we no longer need to fear death. Death has no power over us. And the fourth thing that divine truth frees us from is the personality of sin. You see... When you get saved, you are a new creation. You are no longer known for your past or your sin. We tend to do that as humans. We think of people, we get this idea of them, and that's who they are to us. But see, we are made new when we trust Christ as Lord and Savior. Our past has been forgiven, and our identity is now found in the fact that we are children of God. So this evening I would ask you, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Have you taken that first step of discipleship and been baptized? If you answer this question and your answer is no, then I would say why not make today the day that you decide to be His disciple that you decide you're going to live according to God's Word, you're going to continue in His Word as Jesus says, let someone know, whether it be someone here at Calvary Baptist Church, some other church maybe that's closer to you from wherever you may be watching from, family member, neighbor, let somebody know that today is the day you became a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then I would encourage you, if you haven't been baptized, try to make arrangements to be baptized as soon as you can, as soon as possible. Because it is the first step of discipleship. And it does not need to be something that is just considered not important. Verse 33. They answered him... We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now before you get too harsh on the ones talking here, the religious leaders in the crowd, because they're always the ones making these arguments with Jesus, before you get too hard on them and say, wait a minute now, Israel has a history of being enslaved by other people. It's possible they're talking about spiritual or inner enslavement. Okay? They point out here that they are Abraham's descendants. So they do give a little bit of truth here. And I, want, I just want you to know what they're basically saying is this. They're saying, we don't need what you just shared, Jesus. We're good. We don't, we're Abraham's descendants. We don't need what you're offering. We're good. Sadly, many people today have that same attitude. I don't need Jesus. I don't need to be saved. What do I need to be saved from? Everything's great in my life. Let me say this. You don't know how great life can be until you know life as a child of God. See, nothing could be further from the truth because we are all in need of a Savior. We are all in need of Jesus. Again, they're talking about spiritual slavery because the Jews do have this history of being enslaved. The Babylonians, and in Jesus' day, 
the Romans. So they're talking about spiritual slavery. They're just trying to make a point here. Trying to argue with Jesus. Trying to brush Jesus off. We don't need what you have. Then in verse 34, Jesus answered them. And he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. That's a verse many people don't want to hear. Jesus is saying, anyone who lives a life of open sin, or who have not trusted Him as Lord and Savior, is a slave to sin. The fact of it is, we are all born slaves to sin. The verb here, in verse 34, is a continuous action verb. That's how we know He's talking about a life of open sin. He doesn't mean when you slip up as a Christian. He's saying those who continuously sin, who act like it's no big deal, who think I have no one to answer to. I can live how I want to live. In verse 35, he says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. And I want you to really think about this verse for a minute because what he's doing here, what Jesus is doing here is he's explaining the difference between being a slave to sin and being a child of God or to be saved. You see, the time will come when slaves will no longer be in the house. They will no longer be around the master. They will no longer have the opportunity to be around Jesus. This is what he means when he says remain in the house. He says the son does remain forever. The truth which is our theme throughout this whole passage is there will come a point when it will be too late for people to be saved. This is why it is absolutely vital that if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today, then you need to make today the day of your salvation. Amen. See, Jesus is saying if they stay slaves to sin, they will be judged and cast into the lake of fire for eternity. But those who go from slaves to sons, because again, we are all born slaves, but when we trust Christ as Lord and Savior, we go from slaves to sons or daughters, children of Almighty God, we remain in the house. That means we will be with Jesus for eternity. We will not have to be separated from Him. And then in verse 36 He says, So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus says that when He makes you free, you are free indeed, or you are truly free. Amen. You see, only by having a personal, saving relationship with Jesus Christ can you be 100% free. Being born an American does not make you 100% free. Only trusting Christ as Lord and Savior will. And here's why. Because as long as you believe and continue to believe or to trust Him you are eternally secure. You cannot be freed from the shackles of sin because your mom or your dad was a Christian, your grandmother or your grandfather was a Christian, because some of your ancestors were Christians. You can't claim that, like the Pharisees are here, claiming to be descendants of Abraham thinking that's all they need to be saved. The only way to be saved is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I will say this. Remember this. God has children. He does not have grandchildren. So this evening, I'd ask you this. Are you a slave or are you a son? Do you know the freedom that only divine truth can give? Again, if the answer to that question is no, 
And I would simply encourage you, you can, before this day is even over, before you close your eyes to go to sleep tonight, you can go from being a slave to being a child of God. That brings us to our second point of this evening's message. And that is, Divine Truth Reveals, verses 37 to 47. So we've already looked at Divine Truth Frees. Now we're going to look at how Divine Truth Reveals. And we're going to see that it, it, what it reveals here in this passage is spiritual paternity. Verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. This is Jesus talking again. He says, Yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Jesus is saying, Listen, I understand. I know. You are Jews. You are descendants of Abraham. But he's telling them only physically. What he's saying is, Abraham is not your spiritual father. They aren't acting anything like Abraham. Abraham was a great man of faith. He was obedient to God. Yes, he did mess up a time or two. It's recorded for us in the book of Genesis. But overall, Abraham was a man of faith and was obedient to God. These religious leaders that are arguing with Jesus have no faith in God because they don't even know who God really is. Jesus has already proven this. Let alone do they serve God. You can't serve God if you don't even know who God really is. You see, they want Jesus killed simply because they want Jesus to shut up. They don't want to hear what He's got to say. Verse 38, He says, I speak the things which I have seen with my Father. Therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. And he's getting closer and closer to revealing to them who their actual father is. When he says, I speak to things which I have seen with my father, he's saying, I have been with God the Father, which is another way of Jesus saying, I am equal with God because I am God. And he says, you do the things that you have heard from your father. Now when we get to verse 44. He's going to reveal to them. In a way that they can't misunderstand. Because he's going to be direct and to the point. Who their father is. They're still holding on to this idea that it's Abraham. But I'll go ahead and give you a preview before we get down there. It's <laughs> Satan. Amen. It's the devil. Satan wants nothing more than to steal kill and destroy. And these leaders want the same thing. He wants nothing to do with divine truth. He wants to keep it from humanity. And so do they. They want nothing to do with what Jesus is saying here. Satan wants every single Christian on this earth to be killed. And he will do anything and everything he can to try to lead us away from God. He wants nothing to do with spiritual truth. Divine truth. Verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. Or, if you're from southern West Virginia, Jesus might have said it this way. Act like your daddy. If, you, if that's who your daddy is, act like your daddy. See, they're still, like I said, clinging to this idea that Abraham's their spiritual father. All they need to be saved is to claim that they're descendants of Abraham. And Jesus said, if you really were the sons of Abraham, you would do the deeds of Abraham. You would do what you have been taught by your father to do. And what he means by this is simply, they would have faith, in God and they would be obedient to God. They do the opposite. They have placed more weight and more emphasis 
on their man-made religious rules than they have on obeying God. Then in verse 40, but that, as it is, you are seeking to kill me. He tells them again, you want me dead. I know you want me dead. He says, but as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth. He gives them the motive for why they want him dead. Which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. He says, Abraham never wanted to kill me. You're saying you're sons of Abraham, then act like him. What they really want, what's in their hearts, proves they are not Abraham's spiritual children. He would never want to do this. But their true father, Satan, most certainly does. Verse 40, excuse me, 41. You are doing the deeds of your father. He tells them again. They said to him, We are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. You see, Jesus has just proven Abraham's not their spiritual father, so now they're going to change their answer. They're going to erase their answer and write God's name now. And Jesus is saying here that our deeds, and I don't want you to miss this, I want you to get this. He's saying our deeds confirm our spiritual paternity. If God is our Father, we will demonstrate this or we will show this by our works, which demonstrates our genuine faith. If our deeds go against God's Word, then our paternity is in question. Are we really saved is the question we must ask ourselves. Now they say here to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. You see, this is another jab to Jesus here. They're, they're talking about the circumstances of Jesus' virgin birth, which they've heard stories about. They in no way believe that he really was born of a virgin and that he is the Messiah, but they've, they've heard stories of Mary goes away not pregnant, Mary comes back to Joseph pregnant. They've heard this. And they're accusing Mary here of committing adultery or cheating on Joseph while she's gone. They're calling Jesus an illegitimate child. And they're doing this to say we are better than you because we're not an illegitimate child. He's proven Abraham's not their spiritual father. So now they're resorting to personal attack. And claiming God as their father while they're doing that. I want to point that out. They're claiming God as their father while they're personally attacking Jesus. Verse 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. He says, You don't really... You're not really God's because your deeds don't match up to what your words say. He's making the same logical argument here that their deeds prove that God is not their father. If God were their father, they would love Jesus. They wouldn't want to kill him because they would recognize who Jesus really is and where he's really from and they would believe in him. You see, you cannot love God and reject Jesus. And I want to say that again because that needs to be preached in 2020. You cannot love God and claim to be God's and reject Jesus. Many try to do this today because they don't like the fact that Jesus is the only way to heaven. But you see, when you do this, when you try to separate Jesus out from God, you're not really loving God. You cannot separate Jesus out because He is part of the Trinity of God. He cannot be separated from God because He is God. 
And today, in our society today, God seems to be more popular than ever, but Jesus seems to be more unpopular than ever because this is exactly what people want to do. They want to separate Jesus out and just have God, a God that they define, a God that they claim to know, a God that they say is up with the times. He's no longer against this, that, or the other. He's okay with abortion. He's okay with homosexuality. He's okay with living in open sin. Any God that is okay with that is not the God of the Bible. Is not the God that can save your soul from hell. You cannot separate Jesus from God. In verse 43. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? Again, this is Jesus talking. He says, it is because you cannot hear my word. And he's not talking about their physical ears not working. He's saying they can't hear his word because they don't want to hear his word. To hear or to listen means they must admit who Jesus really is. They must acknowledge that he is the only way to heaven and they simply do not want to do this. That's why so many people want to separate Jesus out from God today. Because without Jesus, they think God is this lump of clay they could mold and shape any way they want. He can be the God for them. There is only one God. And it is through His Son, Jesus Christ, that we know who He is and we can relate to Him. I want to point that out. You cannot separate Jesus from God. Verse 44, the one I give you a preview of. Jesus says, you are of your father the devil. He didn't even make them guess anymore. He's telling them who it is. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. You may be thinking of someone right now who has Satan as their father. You see, Jesus has just proven their spiritual paternity because they're acting just like their father, Satan, or the devil. He is a liar. It's his very nature to be a liar. We can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and see that this is true. When Satan has possessed this serpent and he deceives Eve, he lies to her and says, when you eat this fruit, you will not die, but you will be equal with God. That's why God doesn't want you to eat this. He doesn't want you to be equal with him. He is a liar. And he is also a murderer. I'll say it again. Satan wants nothing more than to see every Christian, every true Bible-thumping Christian that serves Jesus Christ dead. That's what he wants. That's what he is out to do. See, when Satan lies to Eve and Eve falls to sin, death enters into the world. Sin enters into the world. Because of that, Satan's a murderer. That's just one example. You see again though, the point here is these religious leaders who now claim God is their father, they're not acting like God, they're not acting like Abraham, they're acting like Satan. And in verse 45, Jesus says, but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Some people would just rather believe lies. They don't want to hear the truth. They want nothing to do with the truth. Just keep lying to me. Keep tickling my ears. And everything will be okay. Except it won't. You see, Jesus is speaking divine truth to them. But again, they'd rather cling to those lies. They'd rather hang on to these lies than believe the truth. 
Verse 46. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? You see, Jesus is being direct again to the point. Which one of you, he's saying, can find sin in me? And the answer is, none of them. He is the only sinless person to ever exist and remain sinless. And I say that because, remember, Adam and Eve were made perfect. But they failed to sin because of Satan and his lies. But Jesus remains sinless and perfect. And He's asking them here, who, which one of you can produce evidence that would convict me of sin? And again, I say to you, the answer is none of them because it does not exist. There is no evidence to say Jesus did this which was a sin or Jesus did that because it, it was a sin because it did not happen. He is the perfect, sinless Son of God. And then in verse 47 he says, He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear. You don't hear the words of God, so you're not of God. They're not listening to God who is right in front of them, speaking to them. So they're not of God. They're of Satan. He's made this perfectly clear. Because they reject Jesus and His Word. My question to you this evening is this. Who is your spiritual father? If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you can rest assured that God is your father. But if you do not, the answer is Satan. There are no other options. There are only two, God or Satan. There are no other options. So we've looked at divine truth frees and divine truth reveals, in this case, spiritual paternity. Now we come to our third and last point for this evening's message. Divine truth refutes. Verses 48 to 59. The Jews answered and said to him, verse 48, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And I went through, I don't know how many times I've read through John chapter 8, but when I was preparing this message and I read that verse, I had to stop and scratch my head and say, What? What are these guys talking about? They're basically saying, Do we not speak the truth when we say you are a demon-possessed Samaritan? What did they think he was going to do? Admit it and say, yeah, you got me. This whole time, you figured me out. They're crazy. They have no other leg to stand on, you might say, so they're hopping on one foot, trying to do the best they can. You see, here, getting serious again, though. you see, the, this is what you would call man's truth, which isn't truth at all. This is... They have nothing else to argue with. They have no other point to go to, so they're just making it up. That's why it's getting crazy. They're trying to declare who Jesus is despite the fact that He has already told them over and over again who He is. Now I want to point this out. They call Him first a Samaritan. Okay? Which means basically they're calling Him a half-breed. Samaritans were considered half-breeds because they were only half-Jewish. Now, they're insulting Jesus by saying this, by calling him a Samaritan. See, they're, they're resorting back to name-calling and just flat-out lying. But they're, they're calling him a half-breed, and also the Samaritans would question the Jews' exclusive right to be called the children of Abraham, because they would say, wait a minute, we're half children of Abraham. You've got to include us. These religious leaders especially, they, they didn't like that. So they're calling Jesus a Samaritan. 
And if that wasn't bad enough, they go and add another layer on top of it and say, he's a demon-possessed Samaritan. They're saying, he works for Satan. He is a deceiver and a false messiah. That's what they're saying here. Verse 49. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. He's not going to argue with them. He just simply says to them, I do not have a demon. What I do, I do to honor my Father, and you dishonor me. He's saying, with your lies, you are dishonoring me. I want to point this out. You see, they have nothing else to go to. They can't think of any other course of action to take in this confrontation with Jesus, so they resort to bold-faced lies. That's what people do sometimes. They feel backed into a corner. They try to allow their way out. So they call him a demon-possessed Samaritan. Verse 50, Jesus says, But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Jesus is not seeking his own glory. He is seeking God's glory. God the Father. He says, there is one who seeks and judges. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, seeks out men, puts them under conviction, so that they will come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. This is His ministry. To judge them of their sin, because sin must be judged. And when we are put under conviction... The Holy Spirit is judging our sin. He is showing us that sin leads to death. And that if we continue on that course, that's what's going to happen. He judges us of our sin so that we will confess our sin and repent and be saved. That is what God desires for all mankind. He will not force mankind to be saved. It's not everybody gets to go, as some teach. But He wants us to be saved. That's why His salvation plan was designed by Him in such a way that all you have to do is confess Jesus as Lord and Savior and you will be saved. Salvation is open to all mankind. Verse 51, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Those who trust Christ as Lord and Savior will never die. And I don't think we can remind each other of this enough. You see, this statement that he is making here proves that he is God because only God can make this promise and deliver. This is 100% truth right here. He says, again, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. If you are a true disciple of Christ, you will not die. We have eternal life from the very moment we trust him as Lord and Savior. When you feel that great boulder of weight that sin has put on you, lifted off, you have eternal life. As long as you believe and continue to believe in him. The Bible makes it very clear. We must believe and continue to believe in Him. Verse 52, we're going to see what they come up with here. The Jews said to Him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. First of all, he said they will never see death. He didn't say taste of death. They always misquote Jesus when they argue back with what he says. But their point is this. They think they have just found evidence that proves that their truth is truth. He must be demon possessed. He's talking crazy talk. He's promising his followers eternal life when Abraham died. 
when the prophets, these great men of God, died. They believe they have called him in blasphemy. And the truth is, if he wasn't God, it would be blasphemy. But he is God. Verse 53. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham, who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? What they're saying here is, you aren't greater than Abraham and the prophets, are you? Who do you think you are? He's already told them who he is. He is God in the flesh. But they don't want to hear it. And because they don't want to hear it, they don't believe it. Verses 54 and 55. Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. And you have not come to know Him, but I know Him. And if I say that I do not know Him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know Him and keep His word. He just straight up called them a liar, because that's what they are. He says He is not here to glorify Himself, he doesn't have to. God the Father glorifies Him. The same God they claim to know and that they claim as their Father because they can't claim Abraham anymore. He's done proven that wrong. They claim Him as Father, but they don't even know Him. That's what Jesus is saying again here. You claim to know God. You claim to serve God. You claim to honor God. And you don't even know who God is. That would be like saying you're going to go help your neighbor mow the grass and you don't even have a clue who your neighbor is or which direction to go. And he says, I know God. And if I say I don't know God, I'd be a liar like you. But he isn't. God cannot lie. See, Jesus not only knows God, he keeps God's word perfectly. Then in verse 56, he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. They essentially said, Who do you think you are? Do you think you're greater than Abraham? And he's saying, I am greater than Abraham. He says, Your physical ancestor in faith looked forward to my day. He looked forward to Jesus' day, the day that the Messiah would be revealed, God's covenant with Isaac, would be fulfilled. And Jesus says he was glad to see it. He tells them Abraham's not dead. Abraham's in heaven. He sees this day. Abraham got to see it from a heavenly perspective. He's saying in faith Abraham acknowledged that Jesus the Messiah is greater than he is. And that just was like a rock in their shoe to them. They can't stand that. Verse 57, So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? They think they got him again. They say, You're not even old enough to see Abraham. You're not even 50, let alone approximately 1,953 years old. I did the math and looked it up. Which was the approximate span of years from when Abraham entered Canaan until 33 AD. They're saying, you can't have seen Abraham. You're not even 50 years old yet. In verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. He's saying, I have always existed. I existed before Abraham. I'm here in the flesh in front of you, and I will always exist. He is saying that He is the great I Am. He is Yahweh. He is God. He was around before Abraham. This is another way Jesus points out to them. I am 
God. And then in verse 59, our last verse for this evening, Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Jesus just said, I am the great I am. And their response is, let's stone him. He already knows we want him dead. It's not a secret anymore. He said it out loud. Let's just go ahead and do it. But they can't. His time has not yet come. This is how they react to divine truth. They want to go ahead and stone him. See, they want to do this because of what he says in verse 58. It's got them to the point, let's just go ahead and execute him now. He's a blasphemer. He needs to die. They're going by Leviticus chapter 24 verse 16. That says any man who falsely claims to be God must be stoned. The problem is they fail to realize he is not lying or falsely claiming it. He is God. His claim is true. So because his time had not yet come, he hid himself and went out of the temple. We don't know how he hid himself. I like to think it was in a miraculous way. Maybe he just closed their eyes off to see him and walked right by him. His time had not yet come. So as we conclude this evening's message, I would simply remind you that in this passage of Scripture we've looked at, we have looked at divine truth. Divine truth leads to freedom. It frees us from the penalty of sin, the power of sin. It frees us from the purpose of sin and the personality of sin. But the only way to have divine truth and the freedom that comes with it is to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We looked at how divine truth proves, and in this case, it proves spiritual paternity. It proves who your father really is. Jesus has proven that their father is not Abraham, even though they claimed it was. Their father is not God, even though that was their next option. He says, your father is Satan, the devil. There are only two options. God and Satan. And I want you to understand that this evening. There are no other options. If you are a child of God, your deeds will confirm it. And then our third point from this passage, divine truth reproves or proves itself to be the absolute truth and reveals that all other truths are just lies. So do you know divine truth? This evening... You've heard what divine truth is. Not from me, but from God Himself through His Holy Word. Have you been set free and are you a child of God? Have you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and to save you? If you haven't, then today you can. you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then let me encourage you, today can be your day of salvation. Right where you are, sitting, watching this, watching it later, listening to it later, you can know Christ as your Lord and Savior. All you have to do is confess that you're a sinner, repent, ask Him to forgive you. And at this time, I want to lead you in that prayer. All you have to do is pray this prayer and believe it in your heart. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that your Holy Spirit has judged me of these sins. He has brought them to my attention. And right now I humbly come before you and I ask you to save me. Forgive me of my sins. I know that when you laid down your life on the cross, you did it in a substitutionary way. 
That means you died in my place. You took on the wrath of God in my place so that I don't have to. I know that I deserve everything you went through. I deserve to go to hell. But I know that you made a way for me not to. And I ask you to save me. Wash me clean, Lord Jesus. Make me new. I can't do it without you. I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart today, right now, and save my soul from hell. You see, that is all you have to do to be saved. Pray a prayer like that, that exact prayer or something similar, and believe. That's all there is to it. So at this time, I'll ask our pastor, Reverend Daniel Dean, if he would, to close us out in prayer. Thank you, Pastor Jeremy, for that word. Christ indeed is not very popular today. <clears throat> As the pastor said, that God is much, pop much more popular. But we know that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Again, yeah, thank you for being with us this evening. Let's pray one more time. Bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for your anointing, for your blessings. Thank you, Father, for all the Bible-believing churches in our area that are preaching your word and spreading your word. I pray that you would help us to be faithful to you. We do love you. I pray, Lord, that you bless our worship, bless those that are soon to be baptized, waiting in line now, not only at our church, but many churches. Father, I pray that your hand will be upon them. In Jesus' holy name, amen.